Is the U.S. government working on a program to, well, program the way you view religion? A whistleblower who has worked on that program says yes, and he wants you to know exactly what has been going on. The first step towards truth is to be informed. If I told you the Defense Department was using taxpayer dollars to learn how to influence people with religious beliefs in order to control those beliefs, would it really surprise you? Would you think I'm a tinfoil hat wearing conspiracy theorist? Would you care if I told you the program was aimed at controlling fundamentalist Muslims? How about fundamentalist Christians? Here's the backstory. In 2012, Arizona State University's Center for Strategic Communication, or the CSC, was awarded a $6.1 million research grant by DARPA, or the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. The goal, according to the project's website, on ASU's website, is to study the neurobiology of narrative comprehension, validate narrative theories, and explore the connection between narrative and persuasion. A lot of technical talk there, so let's dig into the details. The CSC program is actually about creating narratives using effective communication, largely video, to control the thought process of groups of people, and ultimately to be able to trigger narratives through magnetic stimulation. At its core, the program is focused on how to win the narrative against Muslim extremism. It's a fairly interesting concept. According to documents leaked to us, this project integrates insights from three mutually informing theoretical terrains. In short, the goal of the program is to combat and to change religious narratives because of their role in extremist behavior. The whistleblower who revealed this program to us worked for several years on the program. They asked not to be identified. What were you told about the proposal as you began working through it? Yeah, I thought that was benign. They told me it was about trying to figure out what parts of the brain are affected by narrative persuasion, just to figure it out just for academic reasons. So I looked at narrative transportation, which is basically how an individual is transported into a narrative, how they understand it. Kind of like when you read a good book, you get really enthralled with it. So At its core, the program attempts to map the brain to determine which portions of the brain allow you to accept a narrative presented to you. It's called narrative theory. Mapping this network will lead to a fuller understanding of the influence narrative has on memory, emotion, theory of mind, identity, and persuasion which in turn influence the decision to engage in political violence or join violent groups or support groups ideologically or financially. You see, the project is focused on the belief that the reason Muslims in the Middle East are swayed to religious violence is not because of the reality of what's going on around them per se, but because they are believing a local or a regional narrative. The local and regional narrative then is that the brain automatically assumes things because of uh, a narrative we've been taught since our childhood? Is right, that yeah, that's true. We call those uh, master narratives. So in America, we have this rags to riches master narrative, where if you work really hard, you can become successful and make a ton of money. So in the Middle East, they always use this example of the Pharaoh. That's a master narrative that's in the Quran, where uh, there's this corrupt leader that you know is really bad for society. And they use the example of Sadat. He was assassinated, and when the assassin killed him, he said, I've killed the Pharaoh, I've killed the Pharaoh. So. They assumed that he was relying upon this Islamic master narrative to uh, fuel his actions. So how does the program change this? Again, a lot of technical speak here, so stay with me, but it's broken into three phases. Phase one is to map the narrative comprehension network using a set of stimuli designed from the point of view of two different religious cultures. Phase two will test hypotheses generated in phase one, adding two additional manipulations of narrative, validity, and narrative transportation. And phase three, it investigates possibilities for literally disrupting the activity of the NCN through transcranial magnetic stimulation. Phase three is, is fairly interesting. I noticed in the documentation it says, let's not talk too much about this because who knows if we'll ever get there. But when you do read what phase three is, it is a little surprising. It's called transcranial magnetic stimulation. 
This is not something that's science fiction. It's not something they've cooked up. This is a, a real technique that's already been used in the past, correct? Yeah, it started out in the psychiatry field where people were depressed, and when you're depressed, certain parts of your brain are not functioning correctly. So they created this technology, which is basically a big magnet, and you put it on the brain, and it turns off that part of the brain that's you know, bad or wrong, and it would help them with the depression for several weeks to a month, and they go back and do it again. So this uh, technology has been around for around 10 or 15 years. So, so it's very high-tech propaganda is what we're talking about. High-tech and validated propaganda, yes. If they're able to turn off the part of the brain and get rid of, let's say, the master narrative that would make you not believe a particular statement, um, they would have validated uh, this propaganda. So if they turn off portion X, they, they know that the propaganda is going to work and the individual is going to believe whatever is being told to them. So why do all this? Because the project is based on the idea that despite the good work of the U.S. in the Middle East, the message of that work is not being received. Quote, the frequent rejection of U.S. messaging by local populations in the Middle East, despite U.S. insistence on the objective truth of the U.S. message, illustrates the narrative paradigm at work. The well-documented say-do gap, the document says, between U.S. messages and U.S. actions is seen by some as contributing to a lack of narrative validity in stories produced by the U.S. Similarly, stories of U.S. aid, they say, do not ring true in a culture wherein Christian foreigners since the 11th century have been invaders and sought to destroy and rule. So how to fix this? How do you move someone from simply watching a video or seeing a video all the way down that line to behavior. It's a pretty powerful tool if you're able to do that. Right, so um, first thing that maybe an extremist uh, statements, you know, or a video like Al Qaeda puts out will lead to some individuals doing a suicide bombing, for example. So they're trying to, you know, look at this video or this statement, take away a part of your brain that will think that it fits in with your cultural or master narrative, and that will hopefully lead you to not do this extremist, this violent act. So what you need to know is that this program boils down to one central idea. If people aren't reaching the conclusions the U.S. government would like them to reach, there must be a way to force them to accept these narratives. Remember that the claim is that the U.S., despite giving aid, is viewed in the Middle East as invaders. That, according to the program research, is the product of embedded narrative, not a result of action. So. The view of the U.S. as invaders in countries where we have standing armies, dozens of military bases, the U.S. paying off drug lords in Afghanistan or regional warlords in Iraq, or where we consistently bomb via drone strike in Yemen and Pakistan and in Somalia, or where we fund dictators until those dictators are overthrown and then attempt to fund the rebels who end up becoming dictators. All of that has nothing to do with the U.S. view of Muslims in the Middle East. Because clearly, they're missing the fact that the U.S. gives aid. The next step, control the narrative, and if necessary, use magnetic stimulation to force people to accept the view of the U.S. that we desire them to have. After all, aren't extremist Muslims dangerous? Extremist Christians? See, the problem with the question is, who gets to define extremist? Who decides if religious beliefs are inherently dangerous? And if we believe that government should have the power to control how the extremist thinks, wouldn't they have the authority to decide how and what we all think? And that's a reality check.